Uh, hello and welcome. This is Lincoln Shorts. I'm Sean Roberts, T Chief Technologist for Lincoln Network. I have with me Chris Riley, noted expert on all things interoperability and uh, all things, uh, well, it, I, I guess, should I say formally Mozilla public policy or I yes. guess yeah. what formally is the, the right way to introduce you now? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, so th there's, there's been a lot of discussion, Chris, about um, how to rein in big tech and a lot of it uh, gets into the, I, I think what might be called a rabbit hole or there's other ways of putting it of talking about um, the, the decency act section 230, which in, in free speech, which I think is, something to discuss, but it is not, I, I believe for most of us, the issue. The, the issue is um, allowing new businesses to thrive and be competitive with the, the big tech. So um, you've written previously on um, how you, uh, some ideas on how to adapt an agency like the FTC to help um, uh, provide some oversight um, to uh, big tech like organizations. To provide uh, to allow for this uh, competitive um, behavior that uh, a lot of people are concerned we're not seeing right now, so welcome and uh, let me know what you think. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I've been thinking about interoperability in the context of sort of internet openness and how do we respond to the growing concern over consolidation, centralization in the tech ecosystem for a few years now. I think that you set it up very well. There's a, uh, there's a, there's a fair bit of concern um, coming from a lot of different sources and a lot of different rationales and arguments. From, from my perspective, and when I started thinking about this, I was, I was at Mozilla, I was at Mozilla for, for throughout uh, a lot of the intellectual development of my thinking on interoperability. Uh, Mozilla is an open source, open internet organization, a champion for net neutrality and uh, open standards and technology design and development, open source code. Um, openness is, is uh, pretty core to Mozilla's uh, values and vision as an organization and to my own values and, and how I have built my career in tech policy. Um, from that perspective, I sort of think what makes the internet unique is its openness. And what does open mean? That term can mean a whole lot of different things, right? But in the context of interoperability, it means the idea that you can just sit down and build something and that it will work and that it will work with the rest of the ecosystem where it needs to, and that there won't be gatekeepers, whether they're network operators, platform operators, operating system vendors, or others who will put artificial roadblocks in the way of your ability as a new entrant into this market to do something cool and, and have success with it. So interoperability to me gets to the very heart of that. And it's the principle that these things will be designed to interoperate. Now, how you translate that into the technical engineering is hard. How you translate that into the legal backdrop of competition on antitrust is even harder. So I won't, um, I could talk for hours about both and have many times in the past, but let me give you the thumbnail sketch version. The best form of interoperability from a, how do you reduce the sort of transaction or the friction costs of things working together is when you have a standard. It's something like email, something like internet protocol, a single standard that is relatively fixed in its technology evolution that everybody agrees to use. The costs of, of competing or switching between services in those instances are as about as low as they can be technically. But interoperability doesn't mean that everything needs to have standards. So I've been thinking a lot more about interoperability in the 2020 internet, which is often uh, handled by platforms, large platforms, like Facebook, like YouTube, like Twitter, that set up APIs, application programming interfaces, to enable a sort of an asynchronous or a sort of a one-way interoperability. They allow you as a user to um, use some other service to get some form of data off of their platforms or to put some sort of data into their platforms. Um, I, I think of TweetDeck a lot as an example or an illustration of this. I'm a big fan of TweetDeck. It's now owned by Twitter, but it wasn't originally. And at first it was an independent piece of software that you could use as a Twitter user to read from and, and write to your Twitter feed and interact with the people who you follow on Twitter in a very powerful way. That's interoperability work and that's APIs at work and, and when they're done right. Which and I think using that the, API. Um, yeah, it's, it's using Twitter's APIs, that's right. And, uh, and it's an illustration for me of the kinds of things that we can imagine for the future of the internet if we can encourage more effective APIs to be offered 
to really make it possible for third-party software developers or third-party service operators to really interoperate with the big social networks and, and other uh, information services that we have today. It gets a little heady sometimes to think about how you could combine all of these things and all of these experiences and use them and then innovate downstream from them. But that kind of headiness and sort of open-ended possibility is what has made the internet so magical for so long. And I really want to see us get there. Now, right. how do you get there? The market's not going to get there on its own because the incentives in this setup are to hold, run the whole stack, to run the whole vertical stack of software and services and applications. That's what we've seen. That's the trajectory we've seen. And it's part of the reason the trajectory is concerning is that while there are natural economic and business efficiencies in a single corporate structure running all of the pieces of this, it sets them very well to deliver a consistent to good user experience to really deliver the user something great. So vertical integration in this sense where one company runs all these things has a lot of benefit to it, but they want to keep you there. They want to keep you using all of their services. They want to tie these things together. And so I've, I've caught up Facebook in particular for sort of recreating a walled garden style experience on the modern internet as a way of keeping you on their platform and in a place where they can make the most money off of you and, and, uh, and deliver you a good experience at the same time. So, so uh, AOL, yeah. if you will. AOL, Sorry, well, exactly. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. I think that we see some echoes of that former early pre open internet kind of era in the kinds of wall gardens that we see being built in many quarters of the internet today. Um, because I think that's what the natural incentives of the, of the economic market and of the uh, obligation to, do, to deliver the user a really good polished experience both push to. So I think we need law. I think we need changes in the law. And that's what made me start to uh, study up more on antitrust and dig out the old law school textbooks from 15 years ago and try to remember how case law in the US all fits into this. Um, turns out case law in the U.S. is pretty hard. Case law everywhere is hard to try to understand pre-internet market realities and supply chains and the ways in which vertical deals like fit into the internet. It just doesn't work quite the same way. And so there's, there's a few different doctrines. I'm not going to go into the legal, but it's just, it's a kind of a square peg in a round hole kind of a thing to figure out how you take antitrust doctrine and really understand how best to fit this vision of interoperability into it. So is I it, think, it, go ahead. Yeah. Up a small bit there. So is that why, because there is, um, because the, the, the industry has moved, industry, the tech industry has moved so far and so fast to our benefit to a certain extent as, as consumers. Um, but uh, the, the, the law is not caught up much uh, to the example of why so many people point back to the, dis the uh, Communications and Decency Act, Section 230, because there's really not much other law to, to fall on. So they just kind of drop back to that and, and go off in a rabbit hole. I think that's right in up to a point, right? I mean, the idea that the law hasn't caught up is certainly true, but doesn't capture the whole scale of the miss or the poor alignment between the legal frameworks and models that we have of how to promote good outcomes and the technical ones that we have how to promote good outcomes. I think that, um, and I just wrote a piece about this a couple of weeks ago, Section 230 is particularly poignant because the platforms feel like they're doing something more than just being technology, right? And some of this is the platform's own fault to be blunt because for a long time they were saying, technology is neutral, we're not responsible, we're just building the thing. It's all the users and what they're doing with it. And that's kind of bunk, right? Like there's more that can be done. And I think that, that the platforms were ignoring their own um, at least moral responsibility and culpability as a part of this ecosystem, even at the same time as people outside were giving to putting too much burden on, them, putting too much onus and responsibility on them. There are limits to what they can do, but they have reached a point, I think now in 2020, where the platforms accept that they have some amount of responsibility. And the question is, how do you encourage responsibility without putting traps in this or without creating regulation that is built to push big companies to do the right thing and squashes all the little companies at the same time, which is a huge risk of regulating in this space, right? right. Or regulation that is designed to encourage civility and kindness on the internet or whatever. And that's a repressing all of the free speech rights that are so fundamental to not just democracy, but human rights in general. Like the, the potentials for abuse in, in the law here are, are multifold and nefarious and, and go beyond just the idea that it's hard for a lot to keep up with evolving technology. So it's, it's, um, there's a well, lot of rabbit holes here, but we're, I'm still we're stuck with, we're stuck yeah. with laws that were written when, uh, partially 
to uh, to deal with the dominance of Prodigy and MySpace and <laughs> see if I can remember any of the other names. And the but Rockefeller the, uh, oil and, and, you know, steel yeah. magnets of the early ancient, 20th century. Ancient laws that just don't and apply. And early AT&T, right? Government granted monopoly over the telco infrastructure. That's right. It's not, so they, it's not they a good to thing. evolve. It, it's just, I mean, I don't want to get off in a really weird uh, other uh, uh, subject at, around policy, but is this perhaps somewhat of the problem where um, the legislature is uh, not doing a lot of lawmaking anymore, and and they're they're somewhat relying on other agencies, uh, like perhaps as you would say the FTC to do the heavy lifting for them and to actually implement regulation. I mean, it may be just that's... a way of way of things now, but it, it yeah seems to be yeah. I mean. That. You're, you're making a good point about that. I think that that may be necessary, right? Even the most effective and well-functioning legislature in the world is going to be hard-pressed to directly keep up. We do right. need the legislature to do more. Um, but we're starting to see some pieces. Like, I happen to be a big fan of the Access Act from Senators Werner, Hawley, and Blumenthal from last year. I think that's the kind of act that sets out the right kinds of principles to capture what happened with good antitrust law, the principles of antitrust law are very sound, right? The principles of encouraging market entry, of not necessarily punishing big for the sake of being big, but really trying to identify the anti-competitive acts, really putting the emphasis on consumers and on consumer welfare. I think those principles are still fine. Um, it's how do you translate those into a modern, sorry, I've got my dog has opinions about this as well. Um, how do you translate those principles, which are still valid, into a legislative and ultimately a regulatory or an administrative framework for promoting good things and such complicated and nuanced things. So back to the FTC. The FTC is a great agency, has great principles, has a great com competition bureau and function, needs a little bit more guidance and needs a lot more resources mm -hmm. in order to do the kinds of deep dive case by case. And APIs are, in my mind, a very good illustration of this, right? How do you know whether a platform's APIs ostensibly set up for the purpose of promoting interoperability, actually hit the right balance in practice? How do you know that the security and privacy limitations that they necessi of necessity put on that API are balanced and don't go too far? How do you know that they're calibrating to reduce the odds of a future Cambridge Analytica style incident, which Facebook had, because its original Graph 1.0 API was frankly not well designed and, and had too much information right. being available through it? The only way to imagine this working out well in practice, in my mind, is to have an agency like the FTC with a bunch of computer scientists on staff and with a really open, properly uh, protected dialogue with Facebook and with future companies to understand the API, to understand the business reasons for why the API was designed the way it does. And, and that kind of model of enforcement is hard. It's hard. It's not well tested. We may be able to learn some things from, from financial regulation where we've had to engage in sort of very similarly hands-on but, but participatory engagements with the banks. Um, I think we've got a lot of work to do. SEC is definitely a, a more hands-on agency than really uh, probably any other that, I, that I, I'm aware of. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not going to say it's perfect, and I'm not going to say that we should replicate that model whole hog for the tech industry. Certainly not. Sure. But um, I think there's probably some lessons to learn from it. And, and maybe from the way as well that the UK has adapted it. So the UK has done some really interesting interoperability work through their open banking initiative and tried to tackle that really complex space while promoting openness throughout the course. I think there's a lot there as well. Excellent. Okay, well, it's, uh, that was great. Um, so let's- uh, Super wonky, but- Yeah, no, well, that's- <laughs> That's why, yeah, I want to get into super wonky uh, topics, Good. but uh, make, explain them so that uh, we yeah. can start having discussions about um, facts, not assumptions. Well, thank you very much for your time, Chris. This has been Lincoln Shorts. Uh,